let's just touch on it a little bit. Like Chuck was living in the, the Bay with you guys for a little bit, basically. Like I want to know what was going on with Chuck when he was hanging out in California. Yeah. Um, I guess the story goes, he kind of dropped out of high school and moved to California to, to get a better lineup. He had the Mantis thing going, you know, those early Mantis demos mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and he ended up not with Cam, but he ended up rehooking up with Rick, but you know, he, he was always looking for something better. Even super young Chuck knew that there was better out there. So he uprooted and came to the Bay Area because that's, you know, way before Florida had a scene or anything yeah, there. It yeah. was already on the second wave of of new bands in the underground. And so Chuck came out here to find his find his lineup. And, and I don't remember the name specifically, but he went through a couple failed attempts to get it eventually found a high school kid, Chris Reifert, you know, the drummer on, on screen, bloody gore and mm -hmm. um, stayed with him in Concord. And shoot, I don't know the range of the radio station. Do you remember KVHS? It's exactly like college radio station, except for it was high school. Sadis demo. We were, uh, I don't remember. They had, if it was Monday night or Thursday night, whatever, they had like a late night underground thrash death metal, maybe a demo DJ or something that would play the unknown raw stuff. And, and they were playing this, the, the demo Satis made in 86, the DTP demo. They were playing that on the show. And so Chuck and Chris are hanging out in Concord. They hear it and they go get the demo. And on the, on the demo cassette label, Darren put his phone number, you know, in case somebody wanted to book a show or something. And um, they called the phone number one day, right? It was perfect timing. Cause we had just come out of the practice room, sat down on the couch in the living room, light up a joint and, Darren comes out of the room. He said, Hey man, that was a weird call. Well, who was it? Oh, it's, it's these two guys. They said they're in a band in Concord named death. Of course we all started laughing who would call the band death. And, uh, <laughs> and they said they, they heard our demo and they really like it and they want to just fucking hang out. We're like, all right, let's go see what this is about. So we, we went out to their, went out to Chris's house and it was just two guys. And we went in the bedroom where they were practicing and had a huge white Tom and drum set and two amps up against the other wall. And one amp was connected to the guitar and one amp was connected to a, a mic on a stand. And, and so they just said, well, let's, we're going to jam our shit for you. And, they, and fuck, we, <laughs> it definitely didn't sound like two guys, man. It was crazy. <laughs> wow. And um, they had just got out of the studio. Like they're, they just made the mutilation demo. And it was amazing to watch because even though Darren was a super screamer for Sadis, we never saw anyone do that low guttural, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Chuck doing that just, I mean, dude, um, just a shitty mic and a cord into some PV bass amp or whatever the hell he had. And it, you know, it's, it was incredible. These guys were, these two guys were so powerful hell yeah. and, and we just hit it off. Um, we started hooking up with them and, you know, get a, get a case of low brow or, or Mickey's big mouth or something. We'd go Mickey's big mouth. Yeah. Dude. And we were just hanging out just, you know, like I said before in, in a, in a scene that's full of, you know, violence, forbidden exodus pest, you know, possessed bands like this, you know, we, we were very different, you know, and, you know, and there was a lot of plans being made and, we had big aspirations for this heavy music. We practiced at Darren's dad's house and Darren's dad, not only was he gone most of the time, but when he was there, he was cool with us making noise. So we had, we had a nice setup in the house. So we had those guys move out to our room and the deal was, you know, they had free use of the room, but we couldn't have two drum kits. And Chris was totally cool with Sadis drummer, John playing on this huge Tama kit his parents bought him so it was you know our drummers in heaven playing this huge kit like <laughs> oh man I wish I had this and of course the two guys are just blown away that they could just you know play for hours with no one telling them to stop and then there was a pool out back and we do flips off the diamond board and just get loaded and it, it was a cool oh, hang man. and you know switching off from four piece sadist jamming and having two guys sit over there and watch us and then we switch and then the two guys would set up and then all four sadist guys would sit along the wall and watch them. And, you know, the missing piece for death was a bass player. And I, I became this common denominator. And so when we'd have these, these back-to-back -back practices, sadist and death in the same room, when sadist would finish, I would just down tune 
the bass and just join in with the death guys and just just to help fill out the sound and mm -hmm. it was just it was there and it was cool and once i get one of those adapters to convert cassette to mp3 I have a rehearsal tape of me jamming these songs back then. I want to really get Jesus. that out. Oh, it's I pretty fun. That, dude. Yeah, I mean, Chuck's singing and everything. I mean, it's brutal. Oh, and we're jamming man. like this. And we're and we're we're getting pretty happy with the situation. We're like, man, we could do shows like this. I was cool with doing two sets. You know, and I, you know, I like the workload. Obviously, now we know my career. I I fucking workaholic, but totally. It was uh it was fun. And we were like, let's do shows. Let's let's so obviously on loan from Sadis, but I was integrating into the lineup then um, as a borrowed guy, of course. But I mean, we were kind of like one band in two halves yeah. eventually. And uh, I think Chuck says like, oh, we guys, you know, we, we've got something to say. So we're going to be gone for like a week or two. So, you know, we won't hang out. You guys won't see us or nothing. And we're like, all right. That's cool. Thanks for telling us. I don't know what's up. They're like, oh, no, no, don't worry. We're just we're going to Los Angeles, you know, but we'll be back. Okay, whatever. So they take off and uh, whatever week or two weeks go by and we get back into our routine, start practicing again and go out drinking one night or say, hey, so what's up? What'd you guys go to L.A. for? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're fucking 17 years old. And why, why did you, did you go to Disneyland or something? I mean, what the, <laughs> I mean, you could tell us, man, it's cool. You know, Oh, Chuck's like, no, oh, dude, we went and, uh, you know, combat, we signed a contract with combat records and they gave us a budget and we recorded, we recorded the album, all the songs we've been practicing. We went and recorded them. I'm like, okay, well, who did the bass? You know, I was sitting there. I was their kind of steady bass player at this point. Who did the bass? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chuck's like, ah, oh, fuck. I had to, man. It sucked. I had to do all my guitar. I had to do my solos. I had to sing everything and do bass. And it, it's just, I had so much to do, man. It sucked. And I'm like, oh, shit. I know all the songs. I would have did it. Fuck it. He hits Chris Ryan like, bam, fuck. I told you he would have. And I was like, oh, that close uh, to being on screen bloody gore. <laughs> damn. God damn it, dude. They uh, were just, it was just that kind of shy insecurity to ask. Yeah. yeah. It was just, just kids. And, and they just, they didn't want to assume or, or impose, you know, like the rehearsal thing was a cool setup, but they, they were, I was sadist bass player and they were just like, Let's just take care of that. Uh, so there, it was a, like a respect thing to the sadist guys, you know? Kind of, yeah. Or more just like uh, didn't want to get in that uncomfortable thing of like, hey, can we borrow him in the studio or something? It, was and, that like less of a thing back then? Like, because bands nowadays are so, I use the word incestuous, like trading. Oh, no, yeah. 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 You know, it's like, that's a common thing now. Like, Yeah. And I, I came well, that close, that shit, fucking close. Dude. I know because then we went, we returned to the cycle. We started re double rehearsing and we started booking shows and I, I was back in the spot. So you were, you had the almost with scream bloody gore <laughs> and then you get the redemption with humans. So how does that come about? Well, I mean, from the time that we met the death guys, you know, when they call our phone number off the demo cassette all the way up until Chuck moved back to Florida after the release of Scream Bloody Gore, we had done a lot of hanging out. We were total friends. I mean, the Sadist crew, the Death Guys, we were like one group. Mm -hmm. He felt just as comfortable with me as he did the whole Sadist band. Awesome. I was just the one. The one thing I had was I was the guy that jammed in his lineup. But You've I mean, he was that, buddies with filled all that of, void that yeah, he had in his common yeah. denominator. Yeah, but yeah. um, yeah. And then he moves back to Florida, and he had offered. He told Chris he could stay in the lineup, but he needed to come to Florida. And Chris needed to finish high school. And, I, it, and you know, think about a 17-year-old. Like, oh, am I going to uproot? It was a brutal decision for a That's kid. That's a big move, yeah. Yeah, and so he just said he didn't want to do it. So they just kind of went their own way. And um, and we just kind of lost touch, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and he kicks out leprosy, and we listened to it. It was definitely a, an evolution from mm -hmm. Scream Bloody Gore. We could hear... He had his shit down, but the production was weird um, with Chris just all of a sudden just sliced out of his path. You know, all of a sudden it's like he's just a lone man hanging out with Sadis. And there's now there's no rehearsal split going on. And I introduced him to two of my buddies I had gone to school with for years. They were both named Eric. And so uh, he introduced him to Eric and Eric. And immediately that's 
how they formed autopsy because one eric played guitar one eric played bass boom Boom. chris on drums and chris decided to do vocals so they were a three-piece in their first demo i don't know the name of it but uh the first demo was just eric eric and chris and and i just uh, give mad mad respect to drummers who do vocals while they're drumming it's like yeah so the best was this morning i was like i was like i want to kind of just look at steve's like i know he's been in like these big bands whatever i'll go look at his wikipedia and then i was like I was like counting. I'm like, oh, like 43 bands. Like it was like the, the list on Wikipedia was like, Jesus, you're on that album. The F will do off. All these like crazy, like fucking bands. I was like, what the, that was, oh, all right, that, but you you're, know. you're pulling them away from the human shit. I just want to hear the human story real quick. Individual thought pattern story, all that stuff. There's no, there's no real quick to either of those stories. <laughs> I know. That. Yeah. Human crazy out of the four of us, two of them were from cynic. They had their rehearsal space in Miami drums are set up. So, I mean, I flew all the way in from California, so I was mobile, and it was easy enough for Chuck just to drive the four hours down from Orlando to to Miami. And um, so, yeah. So, how, actually, I have a question about like you know, you said that uh, Paul Masvidal and uh, Sean Reinert were super young kids coming in. Like their talent level when you saw them, like were you just blown? Away? Did you were they something that you had not seen, or like was it something that like? Yeah. No, I was already I was already a cynic fan. Um, I don't know if it's the '88 or the '89. Yeah. Demo had Euroboric forms and stuff. Had yeah. like cool artwork. It wasn't like a crappy demo. It was like a nice package demo of cynic. And um, Paul was singing straight death metal style back then. And um, Tony Choi on bass just shredding and and uh, all the sadist guys liked that demo. And before we left on this on the SOS tour, Sepultura, tour, Obituary Sadist. When I saw the Miami date, I told the Roadrunner guys, that, hey, get Cynic on the show. So they play, we played a uh, crazy place in Miami called the Trash Can. And so Cynic opened the show. And after the show, we went out to eat some late night place. And, I, and that's where I got to, like, kind of talk to Sean and, and vibe with him just as a fan. Like I said, you know, a couple of weeks before I got the news that we were destined to be on the same album. So quick introduction to the guys and a quick – short bonding period you know told them i'm an old fan and of course they were into sadist craziness and so when i showed up to rehearse the songs for the for the studio so we had we had that one night that we kind of met and got to know each other and so yeah it wasn't brand brand new yeah but standing there witnessing you know playing the same shit you know i was i was blown away actually um i stayed at sean's house he had a spare room and sean's routine you know usually what do you do the first thing you wake up you usually take a leak or something get a drink of water sean's first thing was to get right out of bed and sit on the drum kit and play for jesus one or two minutes just a quick little burst but and then he would stretch and yawn and go take his leak (laughs) and so it didn't matter how long i could have slept every (laughs) morning staying at chuck's house or at sean's house it was that's what woke me up like fuck sean's up all right let's get up we would come home from rehearsing and he kept his weed in the freezer and it was like had all this orange hair and just really crystallized and what we were looking for back then dude the orange hairs of the red hair like i said like i said the 80s we had two kinds of weed that's it good and bad orange hairs are fucking stoked yeah, he's yeah. got this because Florida was hard to get weed, and he had to, it was like imported from Georgia, you know. <laughs> and, it was, <laughs> and it was crazy, and we would, and it was like fucking two in the morning. We we walk down the hill and go on his dock, get in the rowboat, and we would just lay on different ends of this boat and just look at the stars. Late, I mean, it's like like 89 90 degrees in the middle of the night, in Miami. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. no real difference between day and night. It's just 24 hour short sleeve weather. And we're just floating on the water, just high, talking about comets and just fucking Aliens cool. And, and just, shit. yeah, just, <laughs> just loaded and just floating there. And, that, and that's kind of the whole connection between me and him doing the, doing the album. I mean, it was just being zonked out of our brain and just in the studio playing shit like, dude, that's a comet. That's a fucking pulsar, <laughs> man. Like, fucking. <laughs> Just loaded, man. <laughs> Back then when we were in the studio, you know, everybody recorded live, man, just like a rehearsal. It's like everyone played at the same time and all the mics were live. Okay, you could overdub vocals and you could overdub solos if you needed to. But 
back then the mindset and the technology level was a live recording. Yes, repairs could be done, overdubs could be done. It wasn't, you know, we're not talking Beatles, let it be type shit, but Mm -hmm. it was old school and that's how we recorded human. But um, yeah, we would stop and the engineer would hit the talk band and go, all right, what happened? And we would just look at each other and just be like, I don't know. <laughs> what are we playing? <laughs> you know, we're like, fuck, <laughs> take a break. And we would go, we'd go outside in the mosquitoes and whew, we're loaded. So we go back in and like, okay, focus, focus, focus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just, that was our that was our mantra because we would just get so absorbed and just derivative. Like we would just we're supposed to be playing like death, which is like paint by numbers. I mean, death riffs are very structured, very mm-hmm, simplistic, mm-hmm. but with Sean in there doing that and me following him, it was going way off abstract. And we would start laughing at each other. Like, dude, you're high. You're fucking high. So we're like, <laughs> yeah. we would just like, we would look at each other and go like this with our hands. We go, focus, 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 focus. Okay. Okay. And we play, we get into it and get into it. And it was no shocker to me that the following year, Senate goes up to Morristown record. And then Sean goes, dude, check out our new album. And I go, fuck, it's called Focus, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. So I don't God, know. Dude. That that might have been a coincidence, but man. Yeah, yeah. I'm just imagining you guys going, dude, you're high. Nah, you're high. All right, focus, focus, <laughs> focus. <laughs> so I yeah, like, just continue to smoke more. Like, dude. We're doing it out. The red light's on, dude. I, I know, dude. I'm fucking load. Okay, go. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What are we playing? <laughs> like, I know what song. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was quite different coming back two years later for individual thought patterns. It was like it was serious business, man. It was yeah. Yeah. totally different thing, man. I mean, I I wasn't indulging as much back then. I think we kind of waited till the work was done maybe um chuck probably fucking from the moment he woke up was puffing i know i was on a different vibe yeah the recording session was totally different and it wasn't like kind of anything rigid it was just a different you know just a just a different vibe i mean i I think chuck probably puffed but it was just probably a couple quick hits and then we just got to business it was way more focus focus and less fucking fucking yeah you know universe and shit so okay so the <laughs> so individual right. thought pattern shit so that was like uh that was like your round two with them and then where do you go from there like after that you toured that record right yep the whole cycle all the way to the end i was yeah i couldn't make the human cycle because sadist plans and stuff and that's where scotty carino came in to fill in for me but when we were finishing up recording individual we went out to lunch and chuck just said, man, I have an idea because we have a festival tour. You know, this it's not a big demand. It's it's going out to Europe and playing for a couple of weeks, but it's it's not a huge full-blown tour full of dates. So I have this idea that, you know, you guys would do it with me. Now, obviously, Andy LaRock came in and laid a few solos. He didn't do any. He was a very quick guest on it. Very important, but very quick guest on the album. So there was never any idea that he would, you know, play on stage or even play a complete song with us. He just did his solos. So we knew we would have to get a a live guitar player, but he said if me and Gene at least could do the first run because the festival tour was occurring before the individual album release. So he really, because we're working in the studio, he had no live band, you know, um, Paul and Sean are history. and, And he's like, can you just go do this European run with me? you know, basically just saying like, look, I'm stuck in the studio with you guys and I don't know what to do for a live musician. And of course we were both like, fuck yeah, we want to go play with death. That'd be awesome. And so we just, we did the festival tour and I think we played, I know we played one song for sure from the album, but it was mostly human and back because Mm -hmm. of how it was before the release date. Nobody's going to know what it is, but we would always say like, Hey, we just got out of the studio here's a new one for you. And it was so obvious when we did it because then everybody just stood there like, Whoa, I never heard this obviously, yeah. but we, I think we increased it to two, maybe three, you know, we're, we're starting to feel comfortable about it. And because of that, we were like, man, those are fun to play live. So when the album came out, you know, me and Gene were like, of course we're going to stick with this. This is fun, you know, big crowds. And it was a good void in time for me to just commit 
to death. And so we stuck around all year and, and uh, did all that touring and man, it was great. And then it was time to start over for a new chapter. And he had a big batch of new songs and he wrote the first song that was going to be on symbolic at my house in Antioch um, with a drum machine. That was crazy. Just me and him and a drum machine. Fuck. And then, uh, then a couple of months later, you know, he's got a bunch of more songs prepared and jeans out there. And I came out there. I had a busted up finger. It actually wasn't a broken bone. It was a dislocated finger. I zigzagged my finger bones and um, I had a big brace on and stuff. And I went out there and of course it's hard to play with that shit on there. And it was a tough session, you know? Um, and I was also right on the verge. My wife was eight or nine months pregnant with our first kid and Chuck was ready to sign a new contract with Roadrunner, book studio time, and and it just didn't work out. So I was there in the preparation phase, you know, songwriting, pre-production. But when it came time to book the studio, it wasn't to be. So he found Kelly, and they went ahead and did that. And um, Kelly didn't last very long. He was already booted by the first first live run, and he got – um. He got one of the road crew to actually sit on our bass, Brian Benson, who tours a lot with Cannibal Corpse now mm-hmm. as a guitar tech. He he finished out the touring cycle just, you know, thumping on the low E with the volume on a half. <laughs> <laughs> and so when the new album idea came around, he called me back up. Same thing. I go to Florida. I'm involved in the songwriting, arranging, and pre-production stuff. And this is when Richard's new in the group and Shannon's the new guitar player. And yeah, and I'm on the pre-production. There's some bonus tracks on the reissue of Sound of Perseverance. You could hear my early ideas with those, but um, same result, different reason. So studio time comes around and and um, he wanted to go right from the studio to a bunch of touring. And it was a huge, big block of time. And I was working full time, just buying a new house and doing life and i i told him i i'm not prepared to leave a job to tour with death i had to keep my job and i said i could go sporadically but i couldn't commit to the full you know load of all the touring and chuck said it was really important for him to have the four guys in the band photo in on the album photo to be on the stage because he was trying to erase this bad reputation of how he went through so many members all the time and and so since I couldn't commit long term to all the road work and stuff that he, he wanted to get a guy. So he found Scott Clendenin that who had worked with uh, some of the control denied guys and stuff. So. So, yeah, it was like ever since human, I was in, out, in, 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 out, out, in, out. And so went back and forth like that. And then even after the sound of persevering touring cycle was over and Chuck removed himself as a singer got a new vocalist and changed the name of the band. Boom. I'm back in again. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of history there with me and, and Chuck, but um, totally to me, it's like one continuous timeline, you know, because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we were always talking on the phone and I was like his go-to, you know, when you would get a local guy to do the tour or whatever and didn't work out, boom, he called me back, you know, and it kind of repeated like that a few times. So when Chuck was like, he had an idea for control denied was it like something that he had always envisioned himself doing as far as stylistically or was it just like all right we need to end death i want to change this around or something that he always wanted to do he got really bored of that vocal style i don't know exactly when but when he had to go out into the booth and sing during the individual thought pattern session he was already burned out yeah Mm -hmm. he just you know, me and him and Gene are recording all these cool riffs, and he, he's just like, man, we're we're kind of like the rush of death metal. He goes, this is heavy, but it's also so creative. And then Scott Burns, engineer, tell him, all right, Chuck, go slap some vocals on there. He hang his head. He go, oh man, time to ruin my own music. You know, we're like, what? Fuck, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you're the Godfather, dude. This is your thing. He's like, ah, I'm just, you know, I don't know. So all the way back then, he was already souring on it. And you could tell because after that album, his vocal style really, really changed. And, you know, he got, he just, he wasn't really a huge fan of the genre that he was a big part of creating. Yeah. He just wasn't a fan of it. When he finally disbanded Death and, and basically got the same lineup with a different vocalist in a new name, the singer he wanted was Warl Dane. And Warl wanted to do it 
he just didn't want to remove himself from anything that Nevermore was doing. But those two guys, they got along great. They were very, very tight friends, very emotionally bound, those two guys. And if, if plans worked out, that's who Chuck envisioned his ultimate sound was oh, his man. riffs with Warl Dane singing. That was, you know, it was no secret he wanted Warl, and Warl couldn't do it. So his demo tapes that when he, you know, freshly writes a song and puts puts it all together for people to hear his ideas, Chuck would sing melodically mm-hmm. and, you know, say like, okay, this is me. Obviously, we're going to get so-and-so, which became Tim Amar, became the singer of Control 9. But I have recordings of Chuck singing like that. And it's pretty good, but his vocal tonal quality, he just, he, he didn't develop that, that melodic power metal style over all those years of doing brutal death metal to where he knew it was fun and it was cool, but it it wasn't convincing. It wasn't serious. It wasn't the pro level that he wanted, but he was right there. Almost. In fact, uh, the, the track on perseverance, uh, painkiller, the priest cover that's chuck screaming yeah you know he's that's a good cover too yeah i mean he reached up out of that uh, old death stuff and he's up doing fucking halford which was you know obvious one of his favorite singers yeah but uh yeah he really tried to get out of that death metal hole for many years and and he knew that if he just had a different vocal style under the band name death that the fan base would just leave so he he knew it needed to have a different name under it. So what's the reception in the beginning? I have no idea. You never paid attention? No, I mean it was the album came out when Chuck was sick. So there was no 98 was the last time Chuck played live. We recorded Control the Night in 99. Uh came out, you know, shortly after. So most of the time between 99 and 2000, he's battling health trying to just walk you know and he was doing various treatments like he would go into a a certain treatment and they would tell him like this is incurable you only have x amount of time we can't do nothing well he wouldn't take no for an answer and he'd go find some alternate treatment alternative treatment i mean and sometimes the results made an improvement there was a point where they had this weird i don't know you went to texas and had this x knife or something and they took part of the tumor out and it alleviated a lot of the pressure on his brain stem and he got some of his mobility back and he was feeling great and he busted out a whole new batch of songs and the music also kind of alleviated a lot of his you know just (laughs) the heaviness of facing his mortality and everything and but he was very productive and we were chatting on the phone quite often about the plans of the new record and how since he the treatment took him away from the touring cycle of the first control tonight he wanted to you know put out the second control tonight and do a big tour but he wanted to go out as death first as a death farewell and bring the control tonight singer to do the last three four songs of the set Mm -hmm with the new songs and have a a physical transition on stage every night to, you know, people in the crowd could witness death turning into control denied. And he had this whole plan and and we were blocking time verbally. We were like, yeah, we're going to do the death farewell with some control denied at the end. And then immediately go out as a full control denied tour. And he had these big plans and everything. And then this was in 2001. I had plans to go in the springtime to get my bass done over there because they had finished the drums, I think in December of 2000. So yeah, early 2001, he's finished, he's working on guitar and stuff. And then right as we're about to book my ticket, he's like, um, hold off, you know, plans might be changed a little. I'm not feeling that great. And then that summer and fall just, oh, she, you know, we lost him in December, obviously. So he, but at the beginning of that year, he was feeling better. And, um, and we almost we almost got to it, but just missed it. There's a partial recording floating out there and stuff. But but yeah, I mean, he had all these big aspirations to tour, and and in his mind, it was up and up and up and more and more. You know, damn, just that through thing. his yeah own mortality, and his, he's literally going down. Still wants to do stuff and put stuff mm-hmm. out. It's like almost like yeah, you know, he like, never stopped. I mean, no, he went. He went out fighting, man. He he fought the healthcare system. He, like I said, every time a doctor told me he was incurable, he said, "Fuck off," and went and found a different doctor. 
Yeah. And, and same with the music, you know, he just continuously writing, continuously planning all the way to the end.